I greet you in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, the one whose resurrection we celebrated just two weeks ago today. I hope that's not so far in your, in your past that you forget to walk and live with Jesus Christ. Today we come to the final paragraph in Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It's been over two years since I began this journey with you, studying the book of Ephesians together. In those first chapters, we rejoice in the fact that we are given a new position in Jesus Christ. We are saved, brought to life, and we are seated with him in the heavenly places. That is, we are placed spiritually into a high and honored place, a place of glory and a place, place of power. Secondly, as we came to the practical section of the book of Ephesians, we have a different position. There we are walking, and our walk or our practical expression of life, our relationships with one another are expressed as we take, put off the old man, die to self, and we put on the new man in Jesus Christ. And we walk as Christians, and this affects not only our interpersonal relationships in the family, husbands and wives, employers, employees, and the job, but it affects our relationships in the church where we're called to live in unity, to express love and, and grace to one another in our speech, and we are walking. Well, now we come to the third posture. As Paul concludes his book to the Ephesians, he says, grand and glorious as that is, unified and beautiful as the peaceful, harmony, harmonious home is, there's another reality you've got to remember. We're in a spiritual warfare. And I call you not to fight, not to put up your dudes and get in and wrestle. I call you simply to stand. Watchman Nee captured the essence of these three postures in the book of Ephesians in his little book called Sit, Walk, Stand. I've never forgotten that title. And as I think of Ephesians, we first sit with Christ in the heavenlies, we walk with Christ in our daily life, but now we also take a stand with Christ in this spiritual warfare. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. I think when Paul tells us to stand, he's definitely reminding us and himself that the battle is really won. Jesus Christ cried on the cross, it is finished, done. So what is there now? While the devil is defeated, he's not put out a commission. He's not incapacitated. He is still active and opposing God and enemy of God and all that is good. So what's our role? <laughs> Hang on to the shirt tails, uh, to coat tails of Jesus Christ. Hang on to that and just be sure the devil doesn't rise up and cause too much trouble and defeat and anxiety uh, uh, otherwise. And so the, uh, the position of the Christian is to rejoice in the victory that Christ has won and to live it and to stand firm in it and recognize that he has done this victory. And so here we are, two weeks after celebrating that victory, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, his defeat of Satan, his defeat of death. Are you walking in that victory? Are you still proclaiming those truths that we had two weeks ago where we identified with the resurrection that we have, Romans 6, in Jesus Christ? We died with him, yes, and we were raised to him, with him in spiritual ways. And so we can declare, I have died with Christ. I have died to sin and self. It has no more power over me. I am living in Christ, and Christ liveth in me. Those are key words and terms and concepts that we need to keep in our focus if we are going to stand strong now in the battle. But I must ask you, are you in the battle? Are you in the spiritual struggle? Are you aware of the enemy? Do you know who's out there? Do you know what he's about? As we read Ephesians 6, let's pay attention to the nature of this battle and the truths that the Apostle Paul gives us. Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord 
and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. This is the classic New Testament scripture on spiritual warfare. Now, I'm not sure what comes to your mind when you think spiritual warfare. To my mind comes, oh, casting out demons, doing special supernatural and powerful things to oppose the devil and to have victory over him, to expose his work. Finding a demon behind every bush, <laughs> you know. It's not what this is talking about, though, is it? The text here lays foundational truths about the spiritual battle that we are in, the nature of our spiritual armor, what kind of armor is it, and the victorious posture of the Christian and the believer who is living in Christ. He doesn't get into those unusual experiences of spiritual warfare that I just mentioned. It's true, some Christians do encounter very powerful demonstrations and exhibits of evil powers and spirit powers in, in heathen religions, in witchcraft and that kind of thing, even in modern day American scenes, yes, in the moral decline in our culture. But in this passage, there are three clear commands that come through to Christians, to each believer in that spiritual warfare. Stand, put on, put on the whole armor, pray. We see at once that these spiritual weapons that God gives us, these tools that are effective in our battle, in our spiritual warfare, are spiritual in nature, not actual, The weapons tell us that the struggle is one for truth and righteousness. That's where the struggle is. The devil is attacking faith and peace. That's where the struggle is. He's trying to get us to doubt our salvation and the word of God. That's where the struggle is. It's not some far out thing out there. It's right in here. It's in my own thoughts and spiritual life. And he's trying to destroy us in those inner ways. It's real. It engages every believer. And maybe you're not aware of it. You ought to be. You need to pay attention to what is happening and what's going on in your own spirit so that you can stand, as, as uh, Paul tells us to here. The weapons are not carnal. They're not tangible. They're not an actual sword or a gun or anything of that sort. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to pull down his, the strongholds of the enemy. So here, the armor is pictured as a soldier's attire. Yeah, that's what the soldier puts on. And it, I was talking to the children in their assembly this morning, and they recognized uh, what the armor pieces are, where they go, and how, what they're useful for. Let's realize that's just an illustration in a physical dimension of what is actually in a spiritual reality in our experience and life. It's only an illustration of the spiritual weapons that God provides for us because the weapons he gives us are for the spiritual struggles that we already are, are facing inwardly 
against the scheming of the devil. And so command number one, stand. Even before Paul talks about identifying the enemy, he's instructing the Christian not to fight, not to struggle, not to wrestle, but simply stand. Take your stand. Stand strong. Shoulders back. Facing the world, facing even the enemy with confidence, knowing he's already been defeated. Paul knows that Christ has won the battle, and we're simply hanging on to his coattails to maintain that victory. The raging fire has been quenched. We must be sure that there's no sparks or hot spots that burst up into flame again. So the devil will take pot shots at us humans, try to get us to trip up, try to discourage us, try to defeat us, and cause us to turn back, lose faith, turn away from God. That's his effort. Stand, Paul says. Stand, but don't do it in your own strength. Stand and realize that your strength is in Jesus Christ. And that's what we've been emphasizing all the way through the book of Ephesians. That's what we emphasize in our own Christian lives, to stand in Christ and in his strength. Yes, we were made alive in Christ. We think Easter, we think resurrection. We're thinking new self, the new birth a new birth experience, but Jesus said it, didn't he? Abide in me and I in you, for without me you can do nothing. That's a pretty blanket statement, isn't it? Without me you can do nothing. If Paul says it here, we must be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We just sang that song. Did we in our own strength confide? Our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. He must win the battle. And so in our standing, we stand in his strength and we stand also identifying the enemy, the devil, the evil one. Lucifer was an angel, perfect, created, bright, and glorious, powerful, but he fell. In his heart of pride, he said, I'll be like the Most High. And in that moment of pride, in that exaltation of self, in that desire and aspiration to become like God, he was cast out of heaven and has ever since been opposing the Most High and working against his good purposes. And so our enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not your husband or wife. It's not your boss at work. Your enemy is not your neighbor that's grouchy and complaining and giving you a hard time. Your enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not the government. Not the Republican or the Democrat Party. Your enemy is a spiritual enemy. Here he's described, the enemy is described as the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When Satan fell from heaven in his pride, about a third of the angelic forces went with him. They sided with him in his rebellion, resistance, his, his uprising against the Lord God Almighty, and a third of the angels joined him in his rebellion. And so Satan has lots and lots of helpers or assistants. Here they're described as, seems like a, a, in a hierarchy of, of authorities. There are some angels like Satan, Satan himself at the top and other, under him his next henchmen and then under them further subordinates and so on right on down the line. Fallen angels arrayed in ranks of authority. Seems like there's so many that they're everywhere, but they're not. They're not omnipresent. They are not omniscient. But Satan is referred to as the prince of the power of the air. And even as air, as we know it, is everywhere here on earth. It seems that Satan is everywhere also. And as the prince of the power of the air, or here he's in the heavenly places, he is over and above the earth. He is 
considered his reign, his domain uh, at, this, at this point, and he and his evil assistants are active from this position over the earth, from there affecting and stirring up difficulties and opposition to God and God's people wherever they can. The devil and his evil assistants are behind the ills and the sins of the entire world. They stir up struggle and inner turmoil in an individual, in individual hearts and lives. They provoke external difficulties and conflicts between persons and nations. They are at times oppressing and possessing individuals. At all times, they are opposing good and holiness and truth and peace. Stand, know who your enemy is. He is active, he is alive, he is evil, and he is powerful. But be assured, victory is yours. Put on the spiritual armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the evil one. Yes, that's a promise. Doesn't mean you maybe will be, make it, but you put on the armor of God so that you will be. You will be equipped. You've got God's armor. It's his armor. He provides it, and you are able to use it for victory. And you will be able to withstand in the evil day. This is a promise from the one who has gotten the victory already, and you can claim that victory as well and be assured of it. So stand your ground. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The second command that comes to us as believers in this passage is to take up the armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God. Put it on. These are God's tools for our victory over the devil's schemes. God provides them as gifts, you might say, as, and we're supposed to receive them as such. Paul tells us time and again in this short passage to put on, to take them up, to fasten on, and so on. So let's take them one by one and put on the whole armor. First of all, the belt of truth. For the Roman soldier wearing a tunic, kind of a, a long house coat robe kind of thing, I guess, the belt would go around his waist and tie that thing together so that there would not be a flapping and a tripping up on, on his garments. It would hold together his clothing and his different parts. It would also provide some protection for his lower abdomen and groin. And it would sometimes have, have uh, leather pieces hanging down to give protection to his upper legs and so on. The, so, the soldier's belt of truth is that which provides protection and holds up our spiritual pants, if you please, so that we're not exposed and vulnerable. This illustrates what God provides as truth for the Christian. Truth. Truth is a tool from God to defeat the father of lies, for so he is called, Deception is one of his main tactics, and we know well in our day how truth is under attack. Everything is questioned. Truth is affirmed and denied. People don't know what is truth. Deception is where the devil is getting people to accept and believe things that are not true. But with God's truth, our loins girt about with truth, our, the belt of truth around us, the lies of Satan can be exposed and can be refuted and can be overcome. He gives lies regarding materialism and money. Those are the most important things in life, he would say. The lies of power and pleasure, those are the most important things in life. Their lies regarding sex and gender. He makes these, he twists these, he perverts them to appeal to our old self, that old man that we died to. And if we have the truth of God in us and we can see clearly with that truth, we can stand with Jesus and we can say, I know who I am. 
those are not the most important things in life. My goal is with Jesus to live for God and we refute the lies of the devil and in the truth we recognize who we are in Christ. And so with all the gender confusion and, and sexual issues and temptations that surround us in our society, we can take a stand and say, I am a child of God. I am created a male, or for some of you, female. I am his person. I am living in that, and I'm not succumbing or accepting the lies of confusion and gender dysphoria that is out there. So when he hurls those accusations and confusion into your mind, stand with God. Stand on truth and declare, I'm a child of God. I'm loved and accepted by him. I'm created in his image. Your lies is not who I am and did not define me. The second piece of armor that Paul declares and, and introduces is the breastplate of righteousness. For the soldier, the breastplate across the upper torso protects obviously his heart, his lungs, his vital organs. For the Christian, this is righteousness. What a spiritual weapon this is. And here Satan attacks us also in regard to righteousness. Righteousness for the Christian is imputed to him because of Jesus Christ. And the righteousness we can claim and have in the sight of God is because we are justified in God's sight and we are declared righteous because of our faith in Jesus. Thank God for that. Righteousness also then is our response to that and our living out a good life of obedience, a good life of right living, if you please, a good life of obedience and respect for God and, and his standards. And the divine weapon that is called righteousness is a, a protection of our lives and protection from the, uh, the uh, damage that Satan would do in our lives. And so with righteousness, we claim and, and, uh, and fasten on to the, the truths of God and the life that Jesus gives us, and we t accept his standards of right living. To stand in the strength of Christ reminds me of the verse in our Sunday school lesson this morning. Wives, be subject to your husbands so that if some of them do not obey the word, they may be one without the word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, that conduct is the righteousness of the wife. And in, in displaying her righteousness, even the opposing husband, unbelieving husband, is won over because of that godly character in her life. Similarly, then, in the same passage, this is the will of God that you, and that's just, not just wives, but husbands also, you, by doing good, should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Doing good, living a righteous life, is a defense against the enemy and it is a defense uh, for your spiritual life. Jesus said it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and give glory to your Father in heaven. Your life of good deeds, good works, righteousness, not by your own power and strength. We've already covered that. You're living in the strength and power of Christ, but your life of good deeds and integrity speaks so clearly and convincingly. They put to silence the ignorance and the accusations of others and protect you from the onslaughts of evil. But without righteousness, we live in sin, we have guilt, we have condemnation, we're vulnerable to attack. Our Sunday school lesson also mentioned how that peace in our husband-wife relationship is so important. And if, if you don't have it, your prayers are hindered. You remember that? Well, peace is the next one we get to here. Peace, the shoes of the gospel of peace. Paul says, put on those shoes. For the Roman soldier, he needed good, sturdy footwear. 
something that could take him over the rough terrain, the slippery places, the rocky, uh, rocky heights, Someone that, something that would give him a good, firm footing in the slippery and dangerous terrain. For the Christian, that's peace. Do you ever think about how wonderful the gift of peace is when you have peace with God? I remember coming out of that little prayer room in the basement there in Bluntstown, Florida, when I'd received Christ as my Savior, I just felt so clean. I wasn't guilty anymore. I had peace with God. I wasn't fearing his judgment. Peace with God, a gift from him. But then also, fruit of the Spirit is peace with your fellow man. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And we can have peace with one another and harmony in our relationships. Peace means wholeness and oneness. And so peace with God because of forgiveness of sins and peace with others, the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can have that as we practice what Ephesians says, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, Oh, yes, there are many things that come up that hurt our relationships, put tension and stress between us. But the reminders time and again through Scripture, and even in Ephesians here, be kind, forgiving, live at peace with one another, live at unity, a peace with God, and peace with others frees you in immense ways from the distractions of worry and anxiety. This gives you a readiness and a freedom to share the gospel with others, the gospel that brought us peace. Now, the devil would, have, would rob us of that peace if he can. When there's unconfessed sin in our lives, our peace is robbed, isn't it? When there's deal, uh, situations there that need to be dealt with and we've neglected that, our relationships are stressed by unforgiving attitudes, we are in place of danger and vulnerability. We're not, uh, we're not utilizing the armor of God for victorious living if we do not maintain peace. Paul would say, put those shoes of peace back on. You remember the story of preacher Peter and the thatched roof? In the times when the Anabaptists in Switzerland were being persecuted, preacher Peter went to sleep, went to bed with his wife at night. He did not hear that coming down the street were three enemies, three persecutors who had evil intents in mind, but pretty soon Peter awoke and there were noises up on his thatched roof. He went to see what was going on and three men were up there taking these bundles of thatch and throwing them down to the ground, destroying his roof. He quickly went in and he had a plan. Mother, get up quick. Work, workmen have come to us. We must prepare them a meal. And so they busied themselves in the cottage and set the table and got a meal. And Peter went out again and said, hello, hello. You've worked long and hard. Please come now. Come down to a meal. We have it ready for you. Startled. The men came down rather sheepishly, but they came inside. They sat at the table and Peter prayed a nice prayer of blessing for the meal and prayed for these workmen that have come to us. They passed the food. They filled their plates, but they couldn't take a bite. And suddenly, as if on cue, they pushed their chairs back, and all three of them got up and went out the door and back up on the roof. And this time, the thatch was going back up on the roof. As these men were repairing the damage they had already done, ashamed of what they had done, because Peter, a peacemaker, had shown the love of Christ even to those who were persecuting him. It takes effort to make peace. It takes commitment to walk in peace. But there's blessings when you do. There's the freedom of relationship. There's the freedom of your conscience. And there's a freedom in your relationship with God. Blessed are the peacemakers. They'll be called children of God. Next, we come to the shield of faith. For the Roman soldier, the shield was a, a, a door, a big two-foot by four-foot door or panel of wood covered over with leather that he could hold on his arm. 
It was big enough that if he would squat down, he could hide behind it. And he used, it was used, obviously, to deflect any attacks from someone coming in front of him, uh, a spear, an arrow, a uh, a flaming dart, and sometimes they did that. They shot arrows or darts that were on fire. The Roman soldier would dip his shield in water, and this leather would soak up the water, and with that, he was ready to go to battle. And it would quench the fiery darts of the enemy, and he was ready. When our shield is soaked with the water of the word, it's ready also to quench the fiery darts of the devil. He would raise questions of doubt to attack our faith. But the shield of faith is ready. He would raise questions of doubt, like with Eve. Did God really say this? Or a fear of failure. Well, I can't do that. Or a push for independence. That's not what I wanted to do. or a drive to get even. I can forgive him for what he did. Or a fear of disapproval. What will others think? Those are the kind of fiery darts that Satan would use to attack us and our faith, but with a faith that is strong in God, confidence in him and his word, you can stand strong. You can quench those fiery darts. There's another promise. You can quench all the fiery darts of the, of the evil one, and so your posture is, Lord, I believe, yes, I believe my faith is sometimes weak, but help my unbelief make it stronger. And then with Paul, you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There is my faith. I believe in God. The fifth armor is the helmet of salvation. Obviously goes on the head, protecting the head and the mind where thoughts and knowledge are, where decisions are made. Take it, Paul says. Take the helmet of salvation. It's as a gift that's being offered. Now you receive it. It's not your creation. Salvation is a gift from God. And as a gift, you receive it and you are protected by it. It's a gift of God because you believe in Jesus Christ. But salvation is also a progressive, ongoing Continuing work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Sanctifying. God has a winning combination. Truth, we've talked about. Truth and faith in our hearts. Righteousness in our life. Salvation in our souls. It's all a wonderful and beautiful combination. Salvation must be alive in our minds. That's where the battle is. That's the battlefield in our minds, in our spirit. Satan would say, well, look what you did. You're not a Christian. How do you think your sins are forgiven? Who says so? You can't be sure. Assurance of salvation is something that Christians sometimes struggle with. And to counter his attacks, wash your mind continually with the truth of God's word. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get your mind out of the gutter. Think on things that are pure and lovely and honorable and commendable. You remember that verse in Philippians? Or in Colossians, set your mind on things above. What are you doing with your mind? What are you filling your mind with? Your mind is the battlefield. Right thinking will lead you to peace and truth. Truth will lead to faith and salvation. These are all interrelated. They're designed and given by God. So, with salvation... Review how you got saved. What happened there? What the Bible teaches you about the plan of salvation and the plan of the gospel. Rehearse it in your mind and be ready and willing to share it with others. It'll be good for them and it's also strengthening for you. Finally, the sword of the spirit. And he explains quickly, this is the word of God. This is the only piece of armor that's both for defense and offense. With the sword, you can deflect the oncoming sword of the enemy, but you can also inflict a wound on him, a blow to the enemy as well. Take this also. It's a part of that same sentence where it says, take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the spirit. This, again, is a gift from God 
that you can use in resisting the devil. Jesus demonstrated beautifully how to use the sword of the spirit to have victory over the devil. You remember the story. Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And at the end, there were three particularly strong and obvious temptations that came to him one by one. And one by one, Jesus each time quoted a scripture. Where did he get it from? Sabbath school? His own study? His mom taught him when he was a boy? He had scripture in his heart. And he pulled it up and he used it effectively. And immediately said, he would say, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And with that, the temptation was over. The word of God was powerful and quick. It was sharper than a two-edged sword, and it put to end that temptation. So Satan came back with number two, and Satan came back with number three. And each time Jesus declared, it is written, and he quoted a scripture. I challenge you, know the word of God, teach it. But not just any old word of God, pardon me, that's not said right. Not just any scripture. If you're tempted, say you're tempted with getting even with someone for hurting you. You don't just start saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Respond with a scripture like Jesus did that is relevant to that temptation. Learn scriptures that are pertinent to the temptation you are facing. Have them ready so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil. So when Jesus was faced with the temptation about turning stones into bread, he used a scripture you man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And his, his response was dead on target. It was pertinent and relevant to that particular temptation. And so when you're being tempted, say, for getting revenge or striking back for someone to hurt you, you can respond like this. It is written, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. Or you can stay with Jesus. I bless those who persecute you. Are you tempted with pornography? Stand with scripture. But have a scripture ready. Stand with Job. You remember what he said? I have made a covenant with my eyes. I will not look lustfully on a maid. He had made a commitment with his eyes not to use them to see and look on and gaze on something that was impure would incite him to lust. Or here's one from Jesus. For the same kind of temptation, Jesus said, anyone who looks on a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You can use scriptures like those to take a stand with truth, with Christ and God, and to use the sword of the spirit to defeat the devil and his temptation. You got a temptation that you can't find a scripture for? Ask me or ask someone else. We'll help you find some. There are scriptures to help you stand strong in the power and strength of Christ that will refute and give you victory over temptation. These six pieces of the spiritual armor are spiritual in nature. They are gifts from God. They are available and usable by every believer. And you need to take them and you take the whole armor of God, every one of them. And perhaps there's one of them that has been neglected by you. Take it on today. Pick it up and begin to use it. But there's one more thing. Pray. Paul moves immediately to his final point, not as an afterthought, and I don't think it's even as an additional a piece of armor, but it's the integral and decisive component of each one of the six. When we don the whole armor of God and put it on, we must stand with each one against the devil's schemes and immerse that with prayer. Stand, praying, Paul would say, at all times, on every occasion. Not just a prayer meeting, but whenever there's an occasion, and there's always occasions. Pray in the Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, letting him guide your thoughts, letting him guide you. And then what you're praying is actually his thoughts, God's thoughts. And you certainly are praying according to the will of God. And then you can claim those promises of God. If we pray anything according to his will, he hears us. 
Well, if you're praying in the Spirit, guided by him, you're praying and guaranteed his help and his promise. Pray with all supplication and prayer, bringing your requests for God's strength and help all the time. Keep alert with all perseverance, Paul says. Be awake, be aware, pay attention, and don't give up, and don't quit. Pray for all the saints. Well, you begun by praying for yourself, no doubt. Yes, that's good, that's fine. But pray also for your fellow soldiers. They're in the same kind of battles you are. And we're in this together, brothers and sisters. We're part of the body. Let's pray for one another. And when we are aware of others who are going through a difficulty, a struggle, whether it's a, a spiritual battle, whether it's a physical one, let's pray for one another. Then Paul says, pray for me too. And I shake my head on this and think, Paul, of all people, you don't need my prayers. But Paul... The seasoned evangelist, the church planner, the traveling missionary, the writer of New Testament books says he needs our prayers too. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And Paul knew he too needed the prayers of his fellow men. Is God speaking to you about a piece of the armor that you've neglected? something you've just not been utilizing as you know you should, and it's leaving a weakness in your armor. It's leaving a weakness in your spiritual warfare. Paul and I invite you to take a stand today. Stand, stand fast, stand up, stand firm, but stand. You realize that the whole armor has not been taken up. You've been weak and vulnerable in your efforts to withstand the evil one. There have been difficulties and stresses and failures in your life because you're not standing strong in each of these pieces of armor. Stand with righteousness and truth, with peace and faith, with salvation and the eternal word of God. Let's bow our heads in silent prayer. And as we pray, think about those spiritual weapons that God is offering and stand to your feet to indicate your desire and intention to begin today taking up another one or more of these pieces of armor to begin using it in a fresh and effective way to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand firm. Stand, therefore, with your armor intact, each piece. Lord God, burn into our lives and hearts and consciousness and awareness who we are in Christ, who our enemy is, the devil and his assistants, what your armor is and how we can utilize it. Oh, give us the grace and the insight and the determination to stand firm with you day by day, moment by moment, effecting these tools to achieve victory in the name of Jesus Christ. For in you, we depend. We rest on you. Amen. Brother Stanley, lead us in a closing song. Number 501 in your... Purple books. <laughs>